I was going for gags of any sort and any any kind. And uh, if an occasional joke, that an occasional piece of a film, is turns out to be a parody of something else for for a brief moment, that's purely accidental. Uh, you you got to be smart to be a president. Let, let, let me be vice president. That's that's a real idiot's job. You're looking at me in a strange way, fellas. I, oh, look, I I I'm going to be president, right? His second film as writer-director was another send-up, this time of Latin American politics, and co-starring his then-wife, Louise Lassa, Bananas. As I had always seen that picture, it was a, a broad gag comedy, but it was essentially, you know, sort of a thin, disguised plot to, to hang jokes on that revolved around a revolution in, in South America somewhere and a love story. I love Eastern philosophy. Mm -hmm. it's, it's metaphysical and metaphysical. redundant. Yes. Abortively pedantic. <laughs> I know just what you mean. Thank you. Uh, have you ever read the I Ching? Not, not the actual Ching itself, but I, I, I have dabbled in Kierkegaard. Oh, well, of course, he's Danish. <laughs> yes. It happens to be about revolution in, in South America because that was a funny subject to me at the time, but, but it's not really very satirical. You know, it may have an occasional individual gag in it, which is a satirical joke, but it's mostly, you know, sort of a surreal, I don't know what to call it exactly. When I was first doing films, I felt the things that were most um, uh, critical to me were the works of people like, uh, you know, the comedians, Chaplin and Keaton and the Marx Brothers. And I did that right through Sleeper which was my most similar to the old silent comedies. But I abandoned that shortly after that because it didn't really interest me. By the late 1960s, Woody Allen had achieved his ambition to become a successful playwright with his Broadway hit, Play It Again, Sam, subsequently made into a film. It brought Diane Keaton and Tony Roberts, the best friend character, into his regular repertory company for the first time. To many critics, this was the first film to draw audiences into Woody Allen's personal world and to introduce one of his favourite themes, the quest for a successful relationship, a theme he was to explore more fully and deeply in his later films. Now, tell her she has the most irresistible eyes you've ever seen. You have the most eyes I've ever seen on any person. You are... Mom, your hand is trembling. It is. That's because you're near. Pardon me? Tell her that. That's because you're near. <laughs> you really know what to say, don't you? Now, tell her that you've met a lot of dames, but she is really something special. Oh, that she won't believe. Oh, no. I have met a lot of dames, but you are really something special. Really? She bought it. I always thought of it as, you know, as just a, a very light little conceit, and I never had any interest in making it into a film. Um, and I was very fortunate that Herb Ross directed it and did a very good job on it, you know. Um, but for me, it's not, it's not something that I look back on with any uh, great pride or anything. It was, it was something that I did at the time. It's not something, again, that I would do well, I don't want to always sound like I'm downgrading my own things. Hello. <coughs> I was just telling Dick I've got friends on this block in the house right across the street. You know the Gibsons? The Gibsons? No. Hal and Eleanor Gibson. They're a fantastic couple. He's an interior decorator. Oh, really? That's sort of a hobby of mine. Oh. Uh-huh. The key to interior decorating is to avoid looking like you used a decorator. I've got to make one quick call. <coughs> Linda, are you wearing jasmine? Me? No. Well, let's see now, what are we drinking? I'll have a J&B on the rocks. He's everybody's insecurity. He's everybody's humanity, if you will. Everybody's anxiety. Bourbon and uh, water. Oh, a bourbon man. I gotta cut down on my drinking. I'm beginning to put away a quart a day. People accept it uh, because I guess they feel they don't look like him. And they don't uh, have it all hanging out quite as much as he as he does in the persona that he puts forth on the screen. Uh, people are always amazed to find out how disciplined he is in real life and how sane and down to earth, which he is. 
But in the beginning, there was a confusion as to whether he really was that nervous bundle of inability. He's not at all. When you made Sleeper, your next film as a director, you used the resources of cinema, obviously, much more thoroughly than you had before, with the special effects, the design of it, right. the science fiction right, setting. True. Was this a mark of more confidence as a director? Well, yes, there you could see a step forward for me. I was starting to um, not worry about simply getting the film in on budget and on schedule only, but working with the sets and the costumes and, and the photography more and trying to, trying to develop myself as a director. Um, and I, I look back favorably on that film because of it, because I think a lot of things worked that I tried to do. And they, were, they were a benefit to me. You got room in there for another head change? Yeah, sure. All right, I'll be back in a little while. Let's go. Does the world as it might be in 2173 interest you, the idea of what the future might be like, or wasn't that the point? It wasn't really the point. The point was just that one day I, I was walking down the street and thought, gosh, it would be really funny to do a movie where I get frozen and wake up in the future. And my first thought, which the, the studio was willing to bankroll, was that it would be a three-hour film, a two-parter. The first part would be an hour and a half comedy in New York City with me. And at the end of the hour, the hour and a half, I would fall into a vat of, you know, the cryogenic vat and get frozen. Then there would be an intermission. And when they'd come in for the second half, we'd be totally in the future. We'd be 200 years in the future. Um, but when I started to write that, it was a Herculean task. I mean, I couldn't, I just couldn't do it. It was such a massive undertaking. I said, forget it, we'll just do the futuristic part of it. All right, the coast is clear. Stop lowering me. This is manual. No, that's fast forward. <laughs> One surprise is one always expects that the soundtrack of such films is going to be on synthesizers and all the rest of it, science fiction, mm -hmm. modern technological music. And you chose New Orleans Jazz as your soundtrack. Right. Why, why did you choose that? I did because I wanted, I, I, you know, the, the kind of synthesizer sound, I, first of all, I don't like, and um, atonal music or anything you might associate with futuristic music, you know, is not very good for comedy. And really what you want is what you associate with the old style comedies, you know, the honky tonk piano, and uh, and so I thought that would be a good backing for comedy scenes. To hear that New Orleans style music is is a perfect accompaniment to those kind of scenes. And then I made myself an amateur clarinetist to justify my use of that soundtrack. My father was black and my mother was white, and vice versa. Oh come on, Miles, you are joking. Mm, I'm always joking. You know that. It's a defense mechanism. Do you want to perform sex with me? Perform sex? Uh, I don't think I'm up to a performance, but I'll rehearse with you if you like. In Sleeper also, you and Diane Keaton are developing a relationship of foil and a lead comedian that hadn't appeared before. Was all that scripted, or did that emerge during the filming? No, it was, it was scripted, and, and we had worked together on stage in, in Play It Again, Sam, and in the movie of that, and we were very close friends, and, um, and she's a hilarious comedian, and, and that, that was the easy part of it. Whatever has the air of spontaneity uh, is probably because we did it well then. The punchline to Sleeper, that you believe in sex and death, things that happen once in a lifetime, mm -hmm. seems to be the germination of the next one, Love and Death. Or was it something you'd, you'd been thinking of making for some time? No, again, the genesis is always so different than how it appears to the outside eye. I was writing a murder mystery, and that murder mystery later turned out to be Annie Hall. But um, I was writing a murder mystery for Diane Keaton and myself, where we were going to play two clever New Yorkers and, and uh, make a lot of jokes on that and get involved with, with a murder. And um, then I started writing, and I thought, look, I don't really want to do a murder mystery because, you know, I don't want to be a mystery writer. And it's funny because I'm such a fan of them, too. So after some months of writing that, I threw it in the drawer. So I was kicking around my house looking for something to do because time was running out and I wanted to do a film. And I just happened to see a Russian history book on my shelf. And I thought, gee, it would be funny to do a film based on all that Russian literature and all those Russian cliches. And I thought it was an area where I could then 
get in a lot of subject matter that I like to talk about, you know, about um, philosophical themes and death and longing, and, and I thought it would be fun to, to do that. Sonia, are you scared of dying? Scared is the wrong word. I'm frightened of it. It's oh, an interesting distinction. Oh, if only God would give me some sign. If he would just speak to me once, anything, one sentence, two words, if he would just cough. Of course there's a God. We're made in his image. You think I was made in God's image? Take a look at me. You think he wears glasses? Not with those frames. Nothingness. Non-existence. Black emptiness. What'd you say? Oh, I, I was just planning my future.